Rosalba, you're in our crawl today, finally. So great that you and your family are here. You've succeeded to be here after the past stressful days, I must say. So very warm welcome to you, to your family, um, Rolando, to David and Daniela. Very warm welcome also to your parents. They unfortunately cannot come, but they are on the online uh, presence, so they will listen and hear you and see us. And a warm welcome also to your, your Dutch parents, as you call them, to Maritza and Daniel. Okay. So better? Is that better? Yeah. Will I start again? No. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. And when it's said like that, I, I just don't dare to. <laughs> Of course, but I welcomed everyone here. And of course, a very warm welcome to all of you here in the aula and on, uh, on um, online uh, live streaming. It's so great that you all celebrate with us the inaugural of the first woman full professor of color at ISIS. I also become emotional <laughs> because of that. And as such, Rosalba, I think you're such a role model for our students, PhD researchers here in ISS, but from the Global South, and uh, for many young academics outside ISS, wherever it is. So that said, a special welcome also to Aminata. She's there. Uh, she will give the laudatio to you, and uh, also special welcome, and I don't know where you're seated, the participants of the Decolonial Summer School. Yeah, there, okay. <laughs> Great, warm welcome. Um, Rosalba, I've been thinking what to say here about you, and I was thinking, yeah, I can start with when you were born, and then what did you do, and where did you go, and things like that, but somehow that I didn't succeed in doing that. So I thought I, I better tell a bit about how I know you since I came here as rector, uh, what I experienced with you, what your experiences uh, uh, I had with you uh, in the past seven years, and also actually what you mean for ISS. And I do that before Aminata takes the floor to give the laudatio. So I got to know you as chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Team. Um, you organized several lectures with the team together to increase our awareness on DNI. Lectures among others by Gloria Wecker, who is online also present, and uh, also, for example, by Sarah Ahmed, which was really interesting and also impactful. And you know that both lectures and also others that you organized with the team made me also think about what is needed at ISS, actually, that I learned a lot from those lectures. Then there were the PhD defenses of Paulina or Sat, and I think she is here, yes, and behind, and uh, more recently Suleika. Uh, examples of new and different approaches in development studies uh, by adopting decolonizing and feminist perspectives and including also form of arts, for example. I uh, remember that we had discussions in the ISS community. Is this also ISS uh, social development studies? And yes, there's no doubt about that. It's very much there and part of uh, development studies, much more accepted nowadays. Uh, here at ISS, far beyond that, and also due to you. So summarizing, I would say you're very daring. You're standing out, you express your values and stand for them. You add important new approaches to development studies. You are a pioneer in this. It can be exemplified by, I think, a hundred of invitations for keynotes all over the world in the past years. Then I saw you again in the LEF project, and together with Aminata and the team, you worked in the city of The Hague, and it was in Corona times, looking at how solidarity stories uh, existed. And you went to the Father Center in uh, the Schilderswijk, to the church at the Besuiderhoutse Weg, and conducted what I call participatory research. And whenever you came from the field and I saw you, you were beaming. So I could really imagine how you would beam as well if you do your field work in Mexico or in other uh, places. 
Also in this field work, it's not only about academic work, it's about connecting, it's about art forms including. Uh, you have been making face masks also together with the team. And I think you're very good in connecting people into a team. I see that also in the FCC. So you participated first as Murat and Elisayos in the FCC. And now recently you joined as the chair of FCC with Elisayos and Georgina. And before Irene was there. And what I feel is that you bring actually all your experiences and expertise in DNI in this field work with all the different participatory approaches and methods, uh, your expertise in decolonizing and feminism, uh, feminisms into the job of FCC chair, your ideas and sincerity in this, which we saw in the past months, impressed me and also the other IBE members very much. So we're looking very much forward to work with you on that as chair FCC, together with, of course, Georgina, Elisa, you're still another member after the summer. And then finally, you're an excellent example of a successful candidate of the first Erasmus University Rotterdam 2525 program, a program focusing on reaching 25% of female professors at the Erasmus University. That succeeded, the percentage has been reached. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Simia Dengtas could not be here. I know that there are other members here of the 2525. Katharina is here. Uh, so also being present. I think the program has been important. You did wonderful work discussing issues, made a beautiful portfolio, and you came out in a very positive way uh, of it. Then you were a bit disappointed that you were not becoming professor immediately. And we said, no, 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 you just have to join the normal and the common uh, professors round where everyone can apply. You did, and you did it, and you became professor. So all in all, I think it's the right time, the right place for your inaugural as professor in global politics, feminisms, and decoloniality. I wish you good luck first in the presentation in inaugural, but I first ask Aminata to the laudatio. Good afternoon, everybody. Beji, beji, fui afo. Make it tire, we condoroja. Beji, beji, fui afo. Make it tire, we condoroja. The song says Beji Beji, which is about praise and honoring. And we're talking about Afo, which means those that came before us. So when we start here and we start with honoring this woman, my sister, mi sisa, mi hermana, we have to do it in the right way. You know. So first thing we do is we call upon our ancestors. Because before us is the great grandbaby of Nemesio Icasa and Juana Dominguez of Heladio Calderon and Dolores Sanchez, of Ramon Garza Madrigal and Francisca Cisneros, of Francisco Moreno Mendoza and Virginia Vargas Chavez. Before us is the grandbaby of Miguel Icasa Gudelia Calderon and Jose Garza Cisneros Guadalupe Moreno Vargas. Before us is the daughter of Victor Icasa y Calderon and Rosalba Garza Moreno. And before us is the sister of Victor Alejandro Icaza Garza and Carlos Alberto Icaza Garza. And before us is the wife and mother of Rolando, Daniela, and David. Now we can get started. <laughs> so we are here to open the way on their behalf for you. And I know we are doing it with their blessing. You are the result and outcome of all their stories, their journeys, their struggles, their triumphs. They rejoice in what you do. And I stand here for them and with them to open the way for you so you can continue to open the way for us. Now, you already know that she's brilliant. I don't even have to talk about that. She's going to share all that brilliance herself. But I thought, what are three things that I can share about you, about my sister? And so three things came to mind. When you listen to her talk, whether she speaks English or Spanish, one thing she says a lot, 
Si claro. Have you heard that? You heard her say that? She says that a lot. So say it with me. Si claro. Yes. This is a Rosalba thing. Right? And si claro. But of course. That's her whole attitude. What you mean that door is closed? Si claro. Let's open it up. Right? So she always brings the si claro energy in whatever she does. Right? The second thing that I got from her is this word praxis. Not practicality, but praxis. Right? So this thing about I bring all of my being and my doing and my arms are open wide and I make stuff happen. That's what she does all the time. Si claro. Right? <laughs> and so she took me to Mexico a couple of years ago and I was kind of sick. And you know how we as women sometimes do. You know, it's okay. I'll step aside. I'll keep going anyway. She was like, no, 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 no. I'm taking you to the doctor. She rearranged the schedule. Rolanda, you go with the kids. Da, da, da. I'm taking you to the doctor. I was like, oh, okay. And she took me, and she took me to a doctor who actually puts my hand, who put her hands on me. I wasn't used to that. I'm used to a doctor who sits behind the desk and writes a prescription, you know. And she took me to this doctor who put her hands on me, and ooh, oh, wait, wait a second. It was like, you know. And I was far sicker than I knew. But she was there with me. She's like, I got you. We're going to do this. I'm not going to let you go out of here. Not in a healthy way. Because, si claro, of course, that's how we roll. Right? Another thing she shared with me is about how she met the Zapatista. You know, these freedom fighters. And they got to meet her. And it's like, oh, you're a professor. That's good. That means you can open the door. She didn't say, well, but I am educated. She says, okay, got you. And she went to that door and held that door open, whatever it takes, because that's what praxis is about. And she held that door, and she did whatever grunt work she had to do until it was time to step up. And now, no ego, nothing. Let's do the work. Whatever it takes, that's who she is. And the third word that comes to mind is this word horizons, right? She has broadened the horizons of academia. She has broadened the horizons of the field. And for me as a woman of color, and for all of us, she's broadening horizons, you know? And some of you here as students, you know there are days you're like, mm, I, mm, I don't know if I can do this, right? And she's like, don't worry, you're brilliant, you can do this, right? Whenever you can only look so far, she will help you to see that far. That's what she does, time and time again. Si claro, right? She can do that. And so I did a little bit of research, and I found that in Mexico, there were these women when it came to war, long before the Europeans came. Soldaderas, you know. And so they didn't have cooks and, and things like that. It was the women who would strap their babies to the back, who would go to the field, set up camps so the men could come and fight. Hey, ho. It was the women who would cook for the men when they would fight. It was the women who nurtured them, who healed them, and when they would drop down, would pick up the guns and keep fighting. Yes. It was the women who would sometimes take on male names and male identities and fight. And after all, you know what? I'm going to stay a man because, you know, horizons tell me that I cannot. That's the people that she came from. And that's who she represents. And that's what she brings to us. So, without further ado, my sister, mi sisa, mi hermana, do your thing. We got you. We celebrate you. We're so proud of you. And we cannot wait to see what you're going to do for all of us. Thank you. Sí, claro. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, um, let me see if um, I got everything here that I need. <clears throat> dear Rector, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, students, friends, and family, peace. Melipona bis. A few months ago, I read a post on Twitter about the role that bees play in the reproduction of corn and, in general, on the well-being of plants that feed us. The number of bees are dropping dramatically across the world. 
and this was presented as one example of the ongoing destruction of the planet. Hopelessness and enormous sadness were expressed in the numerous threats. My Twitter was flooded with images of peace. Then someone posted the hashtag, climate racism, followed by calls to connect struggles to preserve Earth and Earth beings to the anti-racist struggles across the world. Immediately after, someone else posted the following meme. If your environmentalism is an anti-capitalism and anti-racist, then you are just gardening. Recently at ISS, we hosted Baliana Aguilar, a Maya women peasant from Sinanche, Yucatan, and one of the founders of the collective Sumil Moktan. Baliana was invited to share with ISS students in one of the courses I currently led, the experiences of caring for Melipona bees in her Maya community, and how, in so doing, they are rereading and relearning from codices written by Maya people more than five centuries ago. These codices are housed in Spain, in Madrid. But thanks to friends in this city, Baliana and her community have had access to them and to the ancestral knowledge on the caring and stewardship of peace. Baliana shared with us that in ancestral forms of caring for bees, they live in pieces of wood that are hundreds of years old and are used as hives. This form of caring does not expose them to any disease or pesticides as current technologies do. Furthermore, Baliana emphasized that the caring of bees and their honey is not for profit, but for free exchange among Maya communities in the region. Baliana also shared that this knowledge is registered in the codices, and it is how the elders, the abuelitos y abuelitas in Sinanche, have been doing it. And they are doing this caring despite the constant peril of losing their lands due to the interventions from neoliberal, liberal, and neo-leftist governments in Mexico, obsessed with bringing development and economic growth to her community. With this retelling, I'm not speaking for Baliana, who is joining us today via live stream from Sinanche, Yucatan. Hola, Baliana. Rather, I'm honoring one of the many relations who have taught me how to become in and with ideas rather than just learning about those ideas. In sharing Baliana and Sumil Moktan's contemporary experience of be caring through ancestral knowledge that is alive in the elders of the community, I seek to unveil the unequal structures of power, knowledge, gender, and subject formation that allows me to speak now to you as a highly educated mestiza woman and not her. Furthermore, these conditions that are conceptualized as coloniality disregard her and her community while their knowledges have been produced as non-existent. So, how do we undo this? How do we refuse the erasure of coloniality? In what follows, I will share with you some thoughts about decolonization and feminism. Then I will explain how I learned to be a decolonial feminist in academia. Thereafter, I will explain the terms modernity, coloniality, decoloniality, and how doing decolonial feminist work in academia contributes to our possibility of articulating horizons beyond capital development, and gender. I will finalize by sharing a glimpse of my teaching and research plans and close my lecture by honoring my elders, mentors, and teachers sharing a decolonial feminist path. Can we respond to the possibility of an ethical life that is not structurally implicated with the suffering and the consumption of the life of Earth and others? If I had to summarize what is my interest as a scholar and why this question is important, I will say that I'm concerned with what is produced as non-existent by the fields of global politics, feminism, and development. On the other hand, this question helps me to focus on the interconnection between epistemicide and ecocide, or in other words, the destruction of plural knowledges and ways of knowing and the destruction of the life of Earth. Through this question, we can foreground what is produced as non-existent by these two violent movements of erasure. Furthermore, 
This question allows me to engage with what we can do in the university, in our teaching and research, to counter both epistemicide and ecocide. It is important that we talk about this in our quest to decolonize universities, methodologies, curricula, and ourselves. Decolonization has had different meanings across times and temporalities. Lately, as decolonization seems to be just another term to speak about any process and experience dealing with diversity and inclusion, First Nation scholar Yves Talk with Wayne Jiang have insisted that decolonization is not a metaphor, but an ongoing struggle for land restitution, autonomy, and self-determination. In other words, decolonization is political, economic, and cultural transformation that is connected to the preservation of ancestral land, the recovery and acknowledgement of ancestral knowledge, and life horizons beyond capitalism, gender, and development, as the experience of Valiana and Sumil Moktan teach us. But what are these decolonial feminist horizons, you might wonder? In a nutshell, these are what exist after gender and development. These are transmitted to us in words and through deeds that are anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist, anti-ableist, but also life-affirming and coalitional. Life-affirming in the middle of death and destruction of earth and our connections with her. Coalitional in the sense that this encouraged the alignment of one's interests, understandings, and goals with oppressed groups. This is what Argentinian feminist, philosopher, popular educator, and maestra Maria Lugones called deep coalitions. You might wonder now what do life-affirming and coalitional words and deeds sounds and look like. Life-affirming words and deeds are already here, spoken in unfamiliar ways. Over and over, these are iterated in non-colonial languages, in vernaculars excluded from the accepted criteria that validates what is deemed scientific knowledge in academia. To be able to listen and to sense them, one must move with others coalitionally and away from the desire to represent them, classify them. Life-affirming words do not germinate in the middle of the arrogant ignorance of the prophetic intellectualism of the progressive left. By arrogant ignorance, I mean following Santos and Vasquez, an epistemology, a way of knowing, and a form of knowledge that pretends to be wide-ranging or even claiming universal validity while remaining oblivious to the epistemic diversity of the world. The prophetic intellectual of the progressive left on the other hand, following Sara Mota, is best embodied in the figure of the development expert. He who does research about their supposedly non-contemporaneous women and men through mediation such as the notion of development. I will return to this idea of development as a mediation later on. Life-affirming words and deeds are not new or innovative. These are not here to be discovered or to be included in our academic lingo and canons. Life-affirming words and deeds are contrary to bodiless, unrooted, and universal knowing. Life-affirming words and deeds are enfleshed, grounded, positioned in places, bodies, ecologies, temporalities. Maria Lugones beautiful phrase, Tantear en la Obscuridad, is an example of a life-affirming words and deeds that helps me to speak about the ways in which one moves with others coalitionally in social terrains that are unknown when we are looking to identify new geographies of resistance and liberation. She says the following, and I open quote, I use the Spanish word tantear both in the sense of exploring someone's inclination about a particular issue and in the sense of tantear en la oscuridad, putting one's hands in front of oneself as one is walking in the dark, tactively feeling one's way. End of quote. I walk Lugones Tantear en la Oscuridad 17 years ago to reflect on my complicity in the destruction of forms of knowledge, ways of knowing and being in the world, and of the life of Earth as a university-educated feminist embodied the role of gender expert. Tanteo helped me then, as it helps me now, to tactively feel my way, 
wonder for grounds intuition, knowing as a sensorial and sensual experience, as something one does in the company of others, human and more than human others. As a life-affirming word and coalitional deed, Tantear helps me to lay bare the self-attributed privileges of the arrogant, ignorant, knowing subject of academia, and to liberate our capacity of knowing and sensing together. At the end of this lecture, my hope is that you will be able to listen to life-affirming words and sense coalitional deeds when you go back to your everyday life. In the context of international development studies and ISS, I belong to a generation of scholars, scholar activists, and students coming together to unlearn the categories we work with to teach about the so-called Global South. We understand unlearning as an everyday task taking place in every relationship, relationship to whom we are accountable to. In this task, I'm guided by feminist decolonial practical thinking and an ethics of relational accountability. I am conscious that these are academic terms that require further explanation before moving forward. My second hope today is that everyone here can accompany me in every step I'm taking. Let's start with the term feminism with the help of two of my favorite feminist of color writers. You might have heard that feminism is for everyone. This is the first part of the title of the book, Feminism is for Everyone, Passionate Politics, written in 2000 by the late African-American feminist and cultural theorist, Bell Hooks. In defining feminism, Bell Hooks argues that it is, and I open quote, a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression, end of quote. I particularly enjoy Hook's emphasis on feminism as movement, which brings sensation, motion of, uh, sensation of motion, commotion, togetherness. In Living a Feminist Life, Sarah Ahmed defines feminism, and I open quote, an affective inheritance, how our own struggles to make sense of realities that are difficult to grasp become part of a wider struggle, a struggle to be, to make sense of being. End of quote. In sharing how she became a feminist, Ahmed mentions the following, and I open quote. Becoming a feminist is also about generating ideas about the worlds we encounter. Feminist theory, in other words, comes out from the sense-making process of becoming feminist and navigating a way through a world. End of quote. In a world that is largely designed to serve the aspirations and needs of a minority, Ahmed's definition is closer to the ordinary experiences of most people. I particularly enjoy her definition of feminism as it connects to justice and our struggles for trying to make sense of a world that is deeply divided between those who consume the lives of others and of earth and those who are consumed. This brings me to the term decolonial feminism. In the text, Towards a Decolonial Feminism, Maria Lugones explains that the world is organized in atomic, homo homogeneous, separable categories that follow dichotomic and hierarchical logics. For example, these are categories we learn to understand as opposed to each other, in which one is lesser than the other, such as women, men, black, white, poor, rich, underdeveloped, developed, South, North, non-human, human. Lugones proposes the colonial feminism as a lens to analyze how this ecotomous hierarchy works when one thinks about race, gender, and sexuality. I also mention practical thinking, which is also a contribution from Maria Lugones to coalitional work in feminism. Practical thinking basically means that one doesn't think what one doesn't do. For example, when I think ecocide as connected to epistemicide, I do it while teaching and mentoring women of color in higher education on how we can work coalitionally to overcome both. Concretely, this takes the form of a constant search for pedag pedagogical possibilities, for the opening of minds, hearts, ears, when listening to and working alongside struggles across Aviala by First Nation communities, indigenous and Afro-descendant women, peasant, and working class folks 
who are resisting the violent destruction of land, territory, women's bodies, lives, and hopes. My intuition, following bell hooks, is that despite the given parameters of the classroom, this can be transgressed, and that it is possible to think and sense horizons beyond gender and development and act coalitionally about it. This brings me to the term ethics of relational accountability which is inspired by the work of First Nation scholars, Sean Wilson, Linda T. Smith, and Eve Tuck. In essence, these ethics centers our most important relationships to whom we are accountable to. By appointing me as professor, ISS will be the first academic institution in the Netherlands to formally host decoloniality as a field of critical inquiry in the social sciences, at the highest level in the hierarchy of Dutch academia. But the coloniality is not a field of study. The coloniality as a liberating praxis emerged from First Nation communities and Afro-descendant people in Aviala, and their struggles for political autonomy and land restitution. In recent years, the coloniality has attracted exponential international attention that often produce it to be just another academic perspective. Therefore, subscribing to and practicing an ethics of relational accountability makes more sense to me now than never, ever, sorry. <laughs> the words I share with you today emerge from accompanying the actions of black, indigenous, and students of color in Dutch and European higher education institutions that have refused to partake in the suffering of others and the consumption of the life of her. I'm accountable to them. These words germinate alongside First Nation and Afro-descendant communities long struggle for collective liberation in Aviala and as part of the Red Transnational Otros Saberes and the collective Sumil Moktan. Together, we have been sharing the learnings that emerge from defending rivers mountains, land, and our intimate relations with earth. I'm accountable to them as to earth. These words are an echo of the sacred ceremony of fire that my comadre Valiana Aguilar carried out to honor life, friendship, love, relation. I'm accountable to Valiana, Sumil Moktan, the territory, land, and ocean of Sinanche, Yucatan, Mexico. These words were conceived in the nurturer's womb, a network of women of color and critical allies, embarking together to open a space in academia that nurtures pluriversality, or in other words, a world in which many worlds can fit. I'm accountable to her. These words were written in the company of my daughter Daniela, my son David, my partner Rolando, I finalize them imagining the presence of my parents, Rosalba and Victor in this room, while sensing the caring presence of Guadalupe, Gudelia and Ana Maria, my late grandmothers and grand auntie. I am accountable to them. At this point, and before telling you a little bit of how the colonial feminist horizons can help us to speak more often about the connections between ecocide and epistemicide in our struggles for decolonizing universities, it is important that I share with you how, following Sar Ahmed, I learned to try to make sense of what didn't make sense in academia. The violence of representing others and the violence of critical thinking. Or how I learned to be a decolonial feminist in academia. Thereafter, I will try to explain the terms modernity, coloniality, decoloniality with the audience of my 11 and my 17-year-old children in mind. I will ask them later if I did a good job. <laughs> in On Babies and Bad Water, Decolonizing International Development, Olivia Rutatsiwa argues that, and I open quote, international development studies is constitutively defined by colonial amnesia. International development studies is not the only discipline to suffer from this, but these recurrent blind spots and institutionalized erasures are all the more remarkable and unacceptable, given that the enslavement and colonial encounter is what created the need for development studies 
or international solidarity in the first place. End of quote. Due to these silences and erasures, Rutatsiwa argues for the importance of points of departure and asks, where do we start the story of development? Where do I start to tell the story of how I learned to make sense of what didn't make sense? I can start by saying that I'm addressing you today as a decolonial feminist who has never studied development, but that nonetheless is a product of development interventions. I am the granddaughter of peasant families who lost their lands and migrated to new industrialized urban centers in Latin America in the 1950s. I am the first generation of women in my family to attend university. I also belong to the generation of Mexicans that in 1994 witnessed the challenge that the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, Zapatistas, posed to the neoliberal government's government flagship policy, the North America Free Trade Trade Agreement, NAFTA. But I also belong to those who challenge the idea of Mexico, that Mexico is one nation. I also belong to a generation of highly educated mestiza women in Mexico who grew up with images of indigenous women as commanders and in positions of authority. Our mothers and grandmothers did not. Today, I can say that my research is concerned with teaching young people how not to reproduce as non-existent this sort of positioned experiences in international development. In the late 90s, as a junior researcher in a local civil society organization based in Mexico City called the Foro de Apoyo Mutuo, Mutual Support Forum, my task was to develop and conduct a national survey on local civil associations that work transregionally and transnationally. I witnessed firsthand the vibrancy and plurality of associational life within, outside, and in the margins of civil society that was opposing neoliberal policies and, in particular, free trade agreements. The indigenous peasant women I met and worked with then shared with me their horizons for political organization beyond free trade, but also beyond the state, capital, feminism, and gender. Today, this is the transregional agenda for decolonization and depatriarchalization, for re-existence beyond resistance, for the defense of territorio, cuerpo, tierra, territory, body, land. My PhD research under the supervision of Professor Jana Scholte explored this resistance. By presenting a detailed analysis of these three, of three case study um, of civil society organizations that work across borders to resist free trade agreement, I try to make sense of what didn't make sense, the constant erasure and disregard of territorio cuerpo tierra, territory, body, land, by the established frameworks of understanding used by academics, and in particular, the erasure of indigenous peasant women as bearers of knowledge. In my conclusions, I argue that two of the main theoretical frameworks in critical international relations and international political economy literature, namely neo-Gramscian and Polangian approaches, both dealing with transnational resistance, hardly provided an adequate understanding of the rich texture of the associational life across borders I had witnessed and was part of. So I wonder, how do we make sense of these erasures? Later on, I also explore how the established critical frameworks in transnational feminist resistance studies rarely open the possibility to foreground the processes through which researchers like me were making sense of the erasures and how this often took place in the company of those actively engaged in resisting erasure and disregard. In short, the how was lost under the what and this didn't make sense to me. My encounter with the colonial ethics and scholarship took place when I met for the first time Colombian anthropologist Professor Arturo Escobar in a conference where I presented a paper that linked the loss of possibilities beyond development to the loss of lives of racialized women. I will learn to speak about this as the coloniality of epistemicide and ecocide later on, thanks to Arturo Escobar, generous comments and suggestions for further study that led me towards the work of Mexican anthropologist Professor Sochit Leiva on epistemic autonomy and collabor and towards decoloniality. 
At the end of that paper, I ask, what will be necessary within feminist critical scholarship for these to be able to learn from indigenous and working class women resistances to neoliberal regionalism? I didn't think in that moment that sensing the colonial wound will be part of it. But what is the colonial wound? And what do I mean by sensing it? Let me explain this with an example that anyone who was born in the 1970s can relate to. <laughs> this is a recording cassette. <laughs> Some of us use it before iPod, Spotify, and in general, any online music streaming services. Some of us use these cassettes to record music with a tape recorder. I used to record the 1980s pop and rock music hits in both Spanish and English. I recorded and re-recorded over the tapes until one day after so much use and reuse, the tape broke, damaged forever. This was dramatic if your favorite song was on it because it was lost forever. Then you either uh, bought the LP, another last century technology, or you listened patiently to the radio until the song was played and then you recorded again. <laughs> the broken tape, is a good image, so to speak, of how the colonial wounds feels. One day, after listening to the narratives of humanity, civilization, science, progress, self-improvement, development, and feminist empowerment via education, access to civil society, and enjoyment of human rights, and then the re-recording of new versions, the tape finally breaks. For a while, one feels sad and lost and starts looking for another tape to record again. But then, one starts to sense that there is no need to record anything because in silence, one might recover the sense of pleasure of singing and singing with others. Through this example, let me venture to say that modernity is not only the technology behind the tape recorder and its evolution until digital streaming today but also the song sung in languages one does not understand and that speak about ideas, ambitions of the world that are alien and strange, but that everyone seems to aspire to. Is this wrong? No. But the technology of the tape recorder then and music online streaming today, the songs and the recording are considered a good thing to do, a, common sen a commonsensical thing to do something that everyone does or wants to do. So, to stop doing this or aspiring to do this seems irrational, romantic, even dangerous. Furthermore, asking what lies underneath these recordings or the use of the tape recorder is disregarded as a question. And if asked, it is addressed through the views and aspirations of the creators and the designers of the tape recorders then and the online streaming services today. However, the silence of the broken tape reveals that one can sing and dance while singing, but that under generations of re-recordings, our capacity for enjoyment while singing and singing with others is erased over and over with the recording of the next hit until the tape breaks. With this, I'm not trying to trivialize the violence that erasing worlds and ways of beings entail. I don't want to trivialize sensing the wound, sentirse rota. My intention is to connect with all of you today as much as possible in a way that doesn't reproduce more violence. This silence, erasure, and breaking over is coloniality. The coloniality is the movement away from re-recording and the erasure and towards recovering our capacity of sensing the enjoyment that lies in singing and dancing together. We might record the singing, but that is not what matters. What matters is sensing our capacity for enjoyment in this togetherness. Because as Audre Lorde articulated in the uses of the erotic, the erotic as power, and I open quote, it is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experience, we know we can aspire. 
for having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognizing its power. In honor and self-respect, we, we can require no less of ourselves." End of quote. The problem is that the university as we know it is not interested in cultivating and nurturing this possibility, but actively disregard it as nonsensical or understands it as a matter of welfare for productivity. In the critical social sciences, including some feminisms informed by the visions and aspirations of the tape recorders and music online streaming services inventors and designers today, what matters now is reappropriating contemporary technologies. With this, I want to emphasize that the colonial scholars informed by critical, so, sorry, that the colonial scholars and scholars informed by critical social and the constructive social sciences are asking different questions about power, gender, knowledge, earth. The colonial scholars mobilize the notion of coloniality of power, as well as gender, knowledge, being, and capitalism, to name what is not intelligible what doesn't make sense to the dominant rationalities of heteronormativity, Western science, gender, and capital. Coloniality as erasure of what remains outside or in the margins of what is considered as rational has rendered First Nation peoples like my friend Balian and her community and their ways of relating to Earth as unintelligible and non-existent. From a decolonial perspective, I conceptualize with Rolando Vasquez that development works as representation and articulation of colonial difference, or in other words, the division between the human and the savage, between civilization and nature. We describe the function of development as articulating the separation between the consumer and the lives of the people and earth that are being incorporated, dispossessed, extracted, and consumed. From this perspective, development comes to mean the loss of worlds of meaning, worldlessness, the loss of the relation with earth, earlessness, and the loss of the capacity of contextual and flesh knowing, and fleshlessness. These losses are called coloniality of development. By framing the losses in this way, our aim has been to counter ideas of progress, growth, innovations, betterment, positive change, and so on. But more importantly, by speaking about these losses, it is possible to highlight that not everyone experiences development and its dominant mother lineal idea of change equally. As a decolonial feminist, my research priority has not been the analysis of impositions of dominant representations of subalterity but that of exploring reciprocal and coalitional ways of de-silencing knowledges made absent. This has been the case with my research on epistemic struggles against epistemicide and ecocide. Together with Rolando Vasquez, we argue, we have argued for thinking social struggles as epistemic struggles, as an invitation not so much to study them as objects, but rather to recognize the questions they pose to our forms of understanding. With this, we wanted to instigate an engagement with social struggles that includes not only their relation to economic and political forms of domination, for example, neoliberal globalization, but also their capacity to generate knowledges and reveal the limits of our worldviews, including our academic frameworks of understanding. Following the invitation of Zapatista women to avoid erasing them as co-contemporaneous re-sisters, I have explored the coloniality of modern lineal time in both feminisms and development thinking. I have refused erasure by questioning the subjectivity of the development and gender expert, but I have also offered possibilities of relearning to work otherwise in academia as a woman of color. In so doing, I have introduced the notion of vignettes as a small sensorial interventions that invite students of global politics to learn from social resistance to contemporary forms of gender violence. In my research on the governance of diversity in higher education, I have had the privilege of witnessing a partake and partaking in the effects of the students of color occupation of the Magden House at the University of Amsterdam in 2015. Their demand for no democratization without decolonization 
literally rock my world. As part of the University of Amsterdam Diversity Commission, chaired by Emerita Professor Gloria Becker, we implemented a novel perspective that combined intersectionality and decoloniality as a grounding framework. Intersectionality as a feminist perspective and a praxis for social action allow us, allow us to see why distinct social positions of individual students and staff determine how they experience the university. Decoloniality, on the other hand, allows us to see how the dynamics of power differences, social exclusion and discrimination along the axis of race, gender and geographical and economic inequality are connected to the ongoing legacies of colonial history. More recently, in the research on solidarity stories in times of COVID in the city of The Hague with Dr. Aminata Cairo, and in the research on the use that Mexican indigenous women make of public fora, public virtual fora to resist racism in postgraduate education with PhD researcher Marina Cadaval, we prioritize the learning possibilities of experiential knowledges that are found at the margins of communities and in academia as a key towards feminist decolonial horizons. But now, it is time to share with you more about my plans as a professor of global politics, feminisms, and decoloniality. <laughs> okay, so how can we nurture knowledges and learnings in a way that can lead us towards the colonial feminist horizons? Is this actually possible given the parameters of the university, of critical social sciences, of the fields of global politics, development studies, and feminism? To co-generate some tentative answers to these questions, I have put forward a program on global politics, feminisms, and decoloniality that aims to consolidate research on the turn towards an epistemic south in the story of knowledge production in global development at ISS. The program has two thematic priorities, decolonizing research methodologies and decolonial pedagogies. The program will evolve over the next five years with each thematic line working on distinct projects with PhDs, postdocs, a series of research outputs and socially relevant activities with Dutch and other universities, national and international alliances and coalitions. For example, I recently joined the International Multidisciplinary Research Consortium, Planet Hope, weaving concrete utopias before the development, led by Dr. Anna Dinerstein and hosted by the University of Bath, to conduct research with Valiana Aguilar and Sumil Moktan on the learning opportunities that emerge from collaborative strategies of bee stewardship and their translation into pedagogies for classroom like the ones here at ISS. In setting out my professorial research program, teaching is central to it. The classroom at ISS and Erasmus University have been and will continue to be a site of practical thinking, of conceptualization and analysis of claims and practices of decolonization of knowledges and of decolonial pedagogies. This work is ongoing and it will be consolidated in the coming years. This means involving students and investing in developing and practicing the colonial pedagogies as a collective caring endeavor, and as those addressing the challenges of positionality, relationality, and transitions. Pedagogies of positionality refer to teaching practices that seek to expose knowledge in a situated manner. In other words, the geopolitical location of the knowledge that is shared is discussed and the role that a specific canon might play in reproducing intersectional access of exclusion. Pedagogies of relationality refer to teaching practices that seek to transform established relationships in the classroom and across the university. It is not simply participatory approach to teaching, but one in which the plurality of backgrounds and the positionality of students is not suppressed, but on the contrary, enriches the learning experiences for all. Pedagogies of transition refer to those teaching practices that seek to bridge the epistemic border between the classroom and society, and between the classroom and the life of Earth. Working through these pedagogies means that we don't ignore what is surrounding us, but what we actively incorporate it in our activities. This image summarizes my current teaching at ISS, in which decolonial thought and decolonial pedagogies are put in practice to decolonize both 
the ways we teach and learn about development and the way we do research about development. I grow these words searching deep inside me, in silence, with my eyes closed, to feel the embrace of the many women who are not feminist and don't want to be called feminist, but who are constantly struggling for life in the middle of death and violence, who are poniendo el cuerpo. I'm called to go slowly, to retell my, sto my own story as a possibility to share with others how important it is not to produce people as non-existent or hyper-visible, or reduce them to a discourse of alterity, a ticking box in diversity and inclusion plans for action. I want to move, to move slowly throughout coalitional stories led by the rhythm of tango in Maria Lugones' intellectual legacy, while embracing the darkness of Nepantla to feel the burning whispering of Gloria and Saldua in the pit of my stomach. After choking in words in Spanglish, I'm seeking to be healed in the company of Jackie Alexander's prose. My body moves again, tanteando, a body in motion and commotion to rejoice and rejoice again. Audre Lord, tell us we cannot accept less. I sense Aminata Cairo is holding a space for me. Sara Mota, burning in science, reminds me to be courageous. And Gloria Becker, naming me women of color. Those who precede me are to whom I am accountable to. By holding hands with Suleika Bibi Sheikh, Paulina Trejo Mendez, I embark on the uncertain path of unlearning ourselves so we might learn each other. Given the parameters of this lecture, following the legacy of all those who came before me, and to the best of my capacities, I have articulated the impossibilities of being a woman of color in academia, while setting out a decolonial feminist practical thinking and an ethics of relational accountability. I can only hope that my words and my own story are part of yours now. Bis. <laughs> Melipona Bis from Sinanche, Yucatan, Mexico. In a couple of weeks, I will travel to encounter, encounter them guided by Baliana Aguilar and Sumil Moktan. A pathway to walk on what has been a feminist decolonial horizon full of learning possibilities to nurture reciprocity and relation beyond gender, capital, and development. Tanteo, life affirming and coalitional horizons. Before starting our celebration, I would like to thank, to thank and honor those who made it possible for me to be here with you today. To my ancestor, Maria Lugones, and elders, Aminata Cairo, Gloria Becker, Sochit Leiva, thanks for showing me the path towards liberation. To the ISS members of the Nurturer Group, thanks for your company and trust. To current students of the ISS Transition Lab, and the colonial research courses for your enthusiasm and trust in co-learning. To all students of color at Dutch universities, your resistance is a powerful inspiration. To the faculty of the Maria Lugones the Colonial Summer School, thanks for your support always. To colleagues and friends who have sustained me across continents, countries, and over the years. To former and current colleagues at ISS, a special thanks to ISS Secretariat and support staff. To my Havening neighbors, you made of the Hague a home. A mi mamá y a mi papá, Rosalba y Víctor, gracias por acompañarme allá y por decirme lo orgullosos que están de mí. To Rolando, my partner in the colonial transitions towards radical tenderness, love and friendship, intellectual colleague and co-author, Thanks for co-parenting with me. And to my children, Daniel and David, thanks for keeping me away from work, grounding me, and making me happy and proud. Muchas gracias. Many thanks to everyone for being here with me today. Thank you. Thank you.